So uh, there, are the, there are the names up there. I won't go through them all. Through them all. But this concept is for the hot carrier cell is a very different type of solar cell. And the idea is to um, try and increase the efficiencies uh, to much higher levels. <coughs> um, okay, so this is a graph that many of you may have seen before. I borrowed it from Martin Green. Uh, it shows the efficiency of solar cells against the cost uh, of solar cell technologies. First generation technologies, um, silicon based um, uh, wafer technologies, or gallium arsenide indeed, sit somewhere here. High efficiencies, uh, but um, uh, relatively high costs. Um, they're limited by the uh, efficiency of the, um, uh, uh, the single junction cell here of 31%. Uh, thin film technologies, which include many of the ones that we've heard about this afternoon, including Kevin Telluride technologies also, organic solar cells, uh, and the proskites and um, SIG cells, uh, sit down here somewhere. Um, uh, that are taken up to just over 20%, so, um, uh, which is accurate, I think. Uh, but the costs are much lower uh, because they involve thinner materials and foreign substrates. Uh, we want to get up to much higher efficiencies, though. The important point is that going to higher efficiencies allows us to, go to leverage the much lower cost per kilowatt hour. Lower cost per kilowatt uh, <coughs> per watt and also lower cost per kilowatt hour. Tandem cells offer this promise. Uh, a wide range of different possibilities. Um, Carl was talking about the possibility of um, organic uh, tandem cells. There's also the 3-5 uh, tandem cells that um, Adam was talking about in the first talk this afternoon. Uh, many possibilities, but a wide range of cost, cost areas. The costs are very difficult to estimate exactly, uh, but they're somewhere like that. Um, what I want to talk about today is a technology hot carrier solar cells, which fit in, may be fit here. Um, and the reason I can say that, uh, i.e. very high efficiencies, but also very low cost. The reason I can say that is because at the moment, we don't even have a proof of concept of them. So uh, anything that's very theoretical, um, we can say more or less what we like. So that's the advantage of talking about something that's a long, long way in the future. So in theory, it's up there somewhere, but in practice, it's gonna be, uh, I'm probably being optimistic with where the, that in theory box is. Okay, uh, let me move on. So the outline of my talk is I'm gonna start off talking about what high, hot carrier solar cells are and give some idea of what, uh, uh, how they operate move on to talk about hot carrier cooling, because this is the key point about uh, hot carrier cells, looking at the way the carrier is cooled um, and uh, how we can utilize that energy to a better extent. Then moving on to talking about those specific carrier cooling mechanisms and how some of these can be interrupted uh, to um, increase, the, or increase the lifetime of hot carriers. Then look at multiple quantum wells, which have shown evidence for hot carrier cooling, or, or sorry, slowed hot carrier cooling, uh, and look at some of the mechanisms involved there uh, in the superlasses, before, uh, and they involve um, the folding of phonon modes, and um, I'll talk about that in some detail. Then look at um, other materials with large phonon band gaps, differences in the acoustic and the optical phonon energies, which can also suppress the loss of energy to the lattice, or phonon decay. Uh, then I'll, the, the final topic will be looking at some potential device structures, and I'll talk about both electrically coupled and optically coupled type of devices before summarizing. Okay, so the hot carrier cell is different to most PN junction solar cells, or indeed most um, uh, conventional junction solar cells, in that um, it, well, it's much more like a thermoelectric device than it is a, a, a solar cell. Uh, imagine an absorbent material with a very narrow band gap. The, having a narrow band gap means it can absorb a wi very wide range of um, uh, solar energies, uh, uh, solar photons. Uh, and um, in fact, it can be right down to zero band gap. So we have this rather strange concept of the possibility of a metallic uh, absorber for a solar cell. That absorber uh, absorbs a wide range of photon energies, creating a population of high energy carriers, uh, matching the solar spectrum, essentially, in their energies. On the top right there, showing the distribution of energies that you might get immediately after illumination uh, 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 has occurred. Um, over a period of a few tens of femtoseconds, that sort of time, so very, very fast, uh, still a finite time, uh, those carriers scatter with each other, they interact with each other, uh, and they produce a thermal population, but a thermal population which is at a much higher temperature than that of a lattice. So this is the hot carrier population that's generated. Typically, or at least in theory, a different population or different temperature for uh, electrons and holes, but both of them above the lattice temperature. Then, um, over a period of uh, a much longer time scale, 100 times longer, but still very fast, a few picoseconds, uh, there's a uh, thermalization down to uh, the band edge, um, and um, uh, this is the re regime in which most solar cells operate. They, they wait till the carriers are thermalized down to the band edge and then extract the carriers there to, to generate a voltage in the external circuit. Um, but 
uh, then over a longer time scale again, uh, those carriers recombine across the band gap, either relatively or non-relatively, to reduce the, um, the population, and eventually you end up with a situation on the right-hand side there where you have um, back to the uh, situation where you started uh, with a, 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 a um, thermal equilibrium uh, of carrier distribution. The hot carrier cell aims to interrupt this process at this point here and extract the carriers before they can thermalize, thus, thus um, increasing the possible energy that can be extracted. To do that, they need to slow down the rate of carrier cooling very dramatically. Now, that's a very, big, a very difficult task, and I'll talk mostly about that today. Um, and, but also, they need to extract carriers over a very narrow range of energies. Uh, and they need to do so because um, the, hot, the cold carriers in the contacts uh, over here, uh, well, it's important that they don't c cool down the hot carriers in the absorber. So therefore, we need these very narrow range of contacts. Although there is some controversy in the literature as to exactly how thin those contacts have to be. Uh, but imagining that ha occurring, we can take carriers off at those particular energies and then notice that these energies are significantly further apart than the band gap, uh, the, the, the conduction and the valence band, so the voltage generated is much higher. This is where um, the hot carrier cell gains its efficiency, essentially. The, the voltage is decoupled from the band gap, so it can have a much higher voltage than it's not limited by the band gap anymore. In doing so, the carriers are taken off here and they deplete the um, energy levels uh, at this particular, uh, 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 these particular energy levels in the population. Uh, and then the same process of thermalization takes place where the carriers scatter with each other to refill that energy level I over the time scale of tens of femtoseconds and refill that energy level such that at steady state, continuously, carriers can be taken off. Um, okay, so most of the work so far that's been done has been theoretical, but now it's moving on more and more towards the experimental work. And as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we're still waiting for a proof of principle of the overall operation of the device, but we hope that will come in the next few years. The reason it's useful is that the maximum efficiency you can get up to at one sun is 65% in theory uh, with a hot carrier cell with an optimum band gap of 0.7 eV. So that's very, very close to the maximum possible uh, efficiency of 66% uh, that can be possibly achieved even in theory. And the maximum concentration, as always, the efficiency is higher and it goes right up to a, um, a theoretical one of 85%. Interestingly, with a zero band gap. Uh, uh, p uh, th th the optimum is a zero band gap, so uh, this possibility of a metallic absorber, which is a bit peculiar. Um, okay, talking about hot carrier cooling, uh, in order to investigate how we might slow it down, we need to understand how hot carriers cool in materials. Um, and I'm going to show this schematically in the next couple of slides. Uh, this, uh, imagine absorbing a high energy photon into the material, that creates an uh, electron hole pair. Um, uh, normally, most of the energy is absorbed in the electron because that has a smaller effective mass. So I'll talk primarily about electrons. The electron has an oscillating electric field. It moves through the lattice. Uh, um, um, and it, the atoms in the lattice, or the electron clouds around the atoms in the lattice, experience that oscillating electric field. And they are set into mo in motion due to that um, passing uh, uh, oscillating electric field. Um, in doing so, they set the atomic cores op oscillating in the opposite direction, and so we end up with a vibration um, uh, so in, in the lattice, a vibration of the lattice atoms. This, of course, takes some energy and extracts some of the energy from the electron, and it, it is actually, it's a very quantized amount of energy, it's a, a quantized amount of vibrational energy as a phonon, and this optical phonon energy is very a very specific energy for the particular material, and the electron can cool down, losing a whole lot of discrete steps of energy like this, and a series of hops all the way down, and, and losing all of this energy, energy down towards the band edge. Uh, these very discrete energy losses in uh, the optical phonons uh, result in the overall loss uh, occurring. Holes cool in a similar way, but uh, also with optical phonons, but usually to a smaller extent. Um, th th this is a schematic of uh, an opt optical phonon, uh, imagine, multiply that by about um, uh, a factor of 10 to the 12, and we've got the sort of frequency that occurs at, T terahertz they oscillate at. Uh, so we have an optical phonon, it's a standing wave, so there's no energy being lost at this point, oscillating at zone center with no translational momentum. So um, if that uh, can stay like that, there's a possibility that those optical phonons can scatter back with the electrons and recoup the energy and maintain a, a, a pop, uh, an equilibrium between the phonon energies and or phonon population and the electron population. And if that happens, then the carriers, the electrons will stay hot and be, can be extracted in the external circuit and give a high voltage. This is the phonon bottleneck effect, where there's so many phonons being generated that there's no chance for them to decay away and they have to scatter back with electrons. 
So that's the sort of situation that we need uh, to occur. If that happens, we can slow down further carrier cooling. So the critical point is what happens to those um, phonons, those optical phonons, and how do they decay away into acoustic phonons? Acoustic phonons are heat in the lattice, and they also carry a, a, a ha sound, hence the name. Um, and the main mechanism that's been identified is, uh, and, and proven many times is that um, uh, optical phonons decay away into acoustic phonons. And I've got a sch another schematic for this. So again, we have our os oscillating optical phonon at zone center, um, impinging on the atoms either side of that uh, optical phonon here, on both sides, uh, and setting them in motion. And they then set the next set of atoms in motion, and then the next, etc. And so now we have a, a traveling wave of phonons, uh, or uh, uh, oscillations, moving away from the initial central phonon. And because it's uh, moving in this direction, that has to, be, has to be balanced by another one in this direction. And each of these now acoustic phonons moving away from the central phonon has half the energy of the initial one. Uh, so energy is balanced. And because uh, they're moving in opposite directions, momentum is also balanced. So we have an exact balance of the two. But in doing so, in moving away, moving through the material, this is now dissipating the energy and it's essentially lost as heat uh, in, in the material. So this is the process that would be good to interrupt. So looking at back at this uh, diagram again, we can um, think about possible ways we might interrupt some of these processes to reduce the carrier cooling rates. We could not absorb high-energy photons in the first place. This would certainly work, but it wouldn't be a very effective solar cell if it didn't absorb photons. We could um, uh, interrupt uh, or, uh, yes, stop the emission of optical phonons. Now, that would definitely work and, and does indeed happen in small quantum dots, particularly very well passivated quantum dots with a very large spacing between their confined energy levels. They do indeed uh, have very long li um, uh, radiative lifetimes, which is because the, the phonons, sorry, the, the states, the electrons can't lose energy by phonon decay, uh, by emission of phonons. Uh, but the problem is that in doing so, the absorption spectrum becomes very discrete as well, with very narrow lines, and so it wouldn't be ideal for a solar cell overall. Uh, the third, po uh, we want to maximize the absorption of these optical phonons. So the third possibility is to stop the decay of the optical phonons uh, by this um, uh, Clemens decay mechanism uh, to, to uh, emit optical uh, acoustic phonons. And so that's the, b the best chance or one of the ways of um, reducing the carrier cooling rates and maximizing this phonon bottleneck effect. So now I want to change tack a little bit and look at some materials which have shown evidence for slow carrier cooling, uh, multiple quantum wells. And now there's a fair bit of evidence for this, um, but it's not really quite understood exactly how it, how it, how it works. This is some work uh, from NREL um, in the uh, early 90s, um, showing uh, carrier cooling rates in gallium arsenide with characteristic carrier temperatures on the, uh, on the x-axis um, and the um, relaxation times on the y-axis. Um, they, they do indeed show as you increase the inje in injection level, you get an increase in the carrier temperature effectively. This is because uh, more injection means more carriers being generated, which means more phonons being emitted and a greater chance that there's a bottleneck occurring. But the interesting thing happens when uh, they show multiple quantum wells in the same material system, there, there's a much uh, step change in the uh, carrier temperature associated with these multiple quantum wells, so a much bigger change. So presumably some enhancement or uh, exaggeration of the phonon bottleneck effect occurring, but it's not exactly understood why or how. More recently it's been repeated, or similar work has been done at Imperial and Tokyo universities, um, showing uh, multiple quantum wells, uh, indeed showing much lower carrier cooling rates, and the very interesting thing here is that the wider wells, as shown by in the green dots here, in this um, in-gas gallium arsenide phosphide system, uh, the wider wells, as compared to the thinner wells, uh, give a much higher carrier temperature, which is very interesting because you might expect that it's to do with quantum confinement in the materials, electronic quantum confinement, but this, this clearly shows it's not, because the wider wells, of course, have less quantum confinement, or at least it's not a sim simple relationship anyway. Uh, so it's something else other than quantum confinement. Um, there are several possibilities of what might be happening. Um, the one is that um, uh, it could be reducing reduce, reduction of hot carrier diff uh, distribution, um, reduction of hot carrier diffusion. Uh, in a bulk material, carriers are generated in the bulk in the bulk, and they're free to diffuse all the way into the depth of the material into regions where the carrier concentration is low, the hot carrier concentration is low, and hence the phonons being emitted are at low concentration. So they can freely uh, cool away, if you like. In a multiple quantum well, they're physically limited from diffusing into the material because of the barriers, the, the electronic barriers. And so you get a high population of, or locally high population of hot carriers here, and hence a high population of phonons being emitted, and the phonon bottleneck condition can be achieved at a much lower intensity. 
That's one possibility, which almost certainly happens. Um, the second possibility, or another possibility rather, is that um, uh, we can, instead of localizing the carriers, localize the phonons. So these phonons being emitted by the um, hot carriers as they cool can be reflected from the interfaces uh, in, uh, in the super lattice uh, or in the multiple quantum well. Uh, and this is uh, borne out by this diagram of the phonon energies. We're talking about zone center phonons here. So in this case, gallium arsenide phonons, uh, optical phonons, have no overlap at all of energy with aluminium arsenide phonons. Um, and so there should be complete reflection from the interface. I'm cheating a little bit there because it's, it's al actually L gas, but the, the same applies in that case. Uh, the, so this is, in this situation, we'd have reflection from the interface and, and, and hence confinement of the phonons. And again, the phonon bottleneck condition should be achieved. One of the things that's not clear about this is whether um, you need a discrete multiple quantum well type structure with thick barriers such there's no tunneling or interconnection between the quantum wells, or whether there needs to be, uh, or whether a super lattice could be sufficient where there's transport between the um, wells, which obviously would stop the, or negate the um, carrier diffusion model, um, uh, um, but uh, would allow the phonon reflection model to, be, to occur. And there's a lot of work going on and looking at um, different well thicknesses and barrier thicknesses to try and investigate this further to see which, is, which applies. But I'll just talk a little bit about some work which has gone into the phonon reflection um, by carried out at um, Tsukuba in, in our group, looking at multiple quantum wells grown at Tokyo University um, uh, in a very similar system to the one I just described. <coughs> And the fact that you can calculate the phonon modes involved in, this, in these type of structures with a very simple ball and spring type model uh, uh, um, uh, and a, um, a harmonic resonating type of model, uh, which works very well. It predicts very, very accurately the, uh, the carrier concentration, uh, sorry, the, um, the phonon energies uh, in, in gallium arsenide here and the same in aluminium arsenide as well. And then this one over here is the, um, the super, or the, the calculated phonon distribution or, uh, for um, a gallium arsenide L gas multiple quantum well. Uh, so it shows that there is folding of the phonon modes uh, like this, uh, giving a much, uh, many more phonons at zone center than there are in the bulk materials. And that's very important for the next slide. Um, Experimentally, you can then measure these multiple quantum wells using Raman. Raman, of course, is a way to investigate um, the uh, optical phonon energies. And indeed, the, um, uh, the, the, this particular Raman is done a very low wave, ra wave number Raman, using, really requiring a triple filter Raman spectrometer. The one used was at Chemnitz. Um, and uh, the, it's usually phonon energies in Raman are right up at about uh, 300, at least. 300 wave numbers. So down here at 10% um, of that, it's very unusual to see phonons. So these are what would normally be acoustic phonons. They're because of this folding occurring. And if I put up the prediction of the phonon energies here in the folded structure, you can see a very, very good um, uh, matching between the predicted phonon energies here, that's shown by these dotted lines, and the actual ones measured in Raman. So a very good uh, uh, prediction there. Incidentally, the reason that we get um, a, a doublet here inst instead of just one peak is because uh, the, pho the photons of in, in the Raman photons don't ha quite have zero momentum. They've got a small momentum, all photons do. Uh, and, and that's the reason that it, it's not exactly at zone center. So therefore we get these two peaks occurring from either side, uh, plus or minus the photon momentum uh, in the case. There's some evidence for the second uh, peaks as well here. And also, well, the third ones are probably in the noise there, but nonetheless, there is very strong evidence for the first peaks, first order peaks. Okay, so that suggests that the phonon reflection mechanism is certainly occurring. Uh, whether it's contributing to the cot carrier cooling or slowing up cot carrier cooling isn't quite clear. But schematically, back to my diagram again, this um, shows what will be happening in this case. So the optical phonon is oscillating away, emitting acoustic phonons which move away from here, but because there's a very good reflection from the interfaces in the multiple quantum well, they're reflected back from there, and essentially it turns back into a standing wave. So now the energy is, um, uh, uh, again, uh, um, um, elastic, uh, uh, the, uh, because it's in a standing wave, and so there's a chance of scattering that energy back with the first the optical phonons and then with the electrons. And so you should maintain it, and this could well be the mechanism by which uh, slowing carrier cooling is occurring in these multiple quantum worlds. Looking now again at the other mechanism I mentioned, the decay, well, uh, thinking again, back again to the uh, decay of the optical phonons, there's another way of, um, uh, of suppressing this, which we can look at in this way, and that is um, uh, imagining the, uh, well, looking at the phonon dispersion uh, in, say, a bulk material like silicon, or sorry, an elemental material like silicon, 
And we have a continuum of um, um, uh, energies for phonons all the way up to the uh, uh, optical phonon at 63 milli electron volts. Uh, uh, the, an optical phonon decaying in silicon could easily find uh, available states uh, at half the energy of that optical phonon, and so there's no trouble with um, uh, optical phonons decaying in silicon. So silicon isn't a good material for hot carrier absorber. If, on the other hand, we look at a material compound like indium nitride, we've got a big difference in the acoustic phonon energies down here, which are determined by the very heavy and sluggishly moving indium atom, and the very um, um, high energies for the uh, optical phonons up here, uh, determined by the very light vi uh, and fast vibrating um, and nitrogen atom. And here, there's no possibility for decay of the optical phonons into half the energies. There just aren't any states there, at least in perfect materials. Uh, and that's a key point, actually. The quality of the material is, is going to be key here. Uh, there's some evidence, some experimental evidence, showing slow carrier cooling in indium nitride and some other 3.5s with these large phonon bank gaps. Uh, but not quite equivocal. It's, not, it's, it's still equivocal as to exactly whether that's genuinely the case. We can look at other materials as well. Zirconium nitride uh, has a very large gap, too. A smaller overall energies, but a, big, a large phonon band gap. Um, and also hafnium nitride. Uh, which has a very, very similar to indium nitride, uh, 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 but has a large phonon band gap. And there are a number of other materials which have this property too, uh, all of which can suppress the uh, decay. So we can do a catalogue of various materials, uh, and, well, th these are just a few of the, of the possible ones. They're all binary ones at the moment. Uh, most of the calculations have been done on binary ones so far, but ternary and quaternary materials could have it as well. Uh, but they're more complicated to calculate. Um, the, um, uh, but the, all these large, with large phonon energies, which I've highlighted here, um, large phonon band gaps, or I was, uh, perhaps the battery's run out. The um, uh, large, uh, the, they, the, these ones with large phonon energies can s suppress this um, behavior, uh, and so they look very interesting. But the, the other problem with these is that, uh, well, certainly indium nitride, <coughs> has a big problem with the abundance of indium. So long term, that's not going to be a good material to look at. Uh, it's good for testing, uh, testing out the approach, but it's, uh, it's not good for long term. Some of these other materials are very difficult to make. We've been doing some work on germanium carbide. Other groups have been working on tin carbide uh, and lanthanum nitride. They're uh, all very difficult to make. Um, but it turns out that um, some of the possible ones, are, well, very interesting ones, are hafnium nitride and zirconium nitride, both of which um, uh, can be made um, in reasonable quality. Well, some hafnium nitride are of very good quality. And also, they're abundant, well, relatively abundant materials. Zirconium uh, is a very technologically important material. Um, it's uh, uh, more abundant than copper and, and zinc. Um, hafnium is not quite so abundant, but it's also technologically important. Uh, it's it's uh, about the same abundance as tin. Um, so, uh, not, uh, very certainly not low abundance materials. Um, so, um, looking at some evidence for these things, we can look at um, uh, slowed carrier cooling using time-resolved photoluminescence uh, in, in some of these materials. And this first bit of work is some work carried out, um, combination of uh, University of Sydney and our group, uh, showing um, uh, ca slowed carrier cooling in gallium arsenide as compared to indium phosphide. And I'll put up the two graphs there. So, this shows that um, in the indium phosphide material, there are much longer carrier lifetimes uh, um, at hot carrier lifetimes, that is, uh, for the indium phosphide, which has a large phonon band gap as compared to the gallium arsenide, which has a, a zero phonon band gap. And you can plot the carrier temperatures associated with this just by taking vertical slices and fitting a Boltzmann uh, thermal distribution to, to those curves. Um, and uh, indium phosphide has higher carrier temperatures at all times as compared to gallium arsenide, indicative that the indium phosphide band gap, uh, phonon band gap, is giving rise to it. Incidentally, they have about the same electronic band gap. Uh, not exactly, but very similar, which is the reason for choosing that comparison. Then we can also do some other work on um, transit absorption spectroscopy uh, of hafnium nitride now. This is some very recent work, which hasn't yet been published, um, on uh, looking at hafnium nitride, which has now been grown in quite high quality, good quality with sputtering, actually, um, uh, showing some, uh, 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 some interesting hot, hot carrier properties. Uh, and this is, transient absorption is a different type of technique, but um, it's looking at the optical density of the material, and in particular the change in the optical density as it's illuminated with a, uh, a pump wavelength. Um, and importantly, these negative values here show a decrease in the optical density of the material, which is associated with bleaching of the material, a very small amount of bleaching. 
And that can, in turn, be associated with the presence of hot carriers, because uh, there's, there's no opportunity for those carriers to decay away, so they remain hot, or thermalize away, so they remain hot. Uh, and you can fit a, a lifetime, or a, yeah, a lifetime to these uh, curves, um, of a very long lifetime of 1.7 nanoseconds in this case, which might not sound particularly long, but compared to the picoseconds that you normally have with thermalization times, this is, uh, 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 well, uh, three orders of magnitude greater. So very, very uh, 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 long lifetimes in, in, in comparison, and so the, the sort of num numbers that are going to be needed. This is still equivocal as to whether it really is due to hot carriers and the, or slowed hot carrier cooling in the materials, but nonetheless, it's very, very strong evidence or good evidence that there is an, it's a very promising approach and a very promising material. Okay, and the final topic, I just want to talk about um, uh, some of the possible configurations of devices in these materials. Thank you. That's right. Uh, so, um, the, the, there's a couple of possibilities. Well, there are many, many possibilities, but a couple of broad areas that uh, you might be able to configure devices. The first is a fairly conventional, or what you might call conventional, uh, electrically coupled type of device. So, this would be the way that you would make a normal solar cell uh, with contacts on the top and bottom. Uh, uh, with a transparent contact on top, illuminating through that, and uh, the hot carrier absorber here is something like we've been talking about uh, earlier in the talk. <coughs> and carriers would be extracted through selective contacts, so that that's a difference from normal cells, uh, and um, be generate current at external circuit, uh, we hope, at a high voltage. Um, the absorber material uh, might be uh, something like I've been talking about with perhaps a phononic band gap um, um, fundamental material here, here maybe combined with a um, multiple quantum well in this sort of way maybe. So a multiple quantum well of the nitrides looks very promising. And maybe that could be reproduced in um, 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 some of the transition metal nitrides in, in as well, uh, possibly with oxide barriers. Um, so this has the, uh, well, uh, th this is certainly a way to make the device, but it has the disadvantage that... Um, uh, the, you have to optimize both the, all of the hot carrier properties here, the optical absorption properties coming in through the front surface, uh, uh, the contacts here, and also very good transport to the contacts. So all those things have to be optimized, just as you do in a, any normal solar cell. But it's actually very difficult to optimize all those things at the same time. So one of the possibilities is to uh, look at a different type of um, configuration, at least initially, and that is to have the same sort of uh, absorber material, or something very similar anyway, um, but to uh, allow that to sit at open circuit, so we're not extracting carriers directly from it, and, uh, and a body sitting at open circuit, um, has a, if it's got a high relative efficiency, will luminesce, um, and luminesce across a wide spectrum. Um, it's not really a black body, or it might be actually, if it's got a zero band gap, but it's a, it's a wide, uh, has a wide energy range of emission. <coughs> Um, uh, and, and that energy range can be limited, or on the back surface, we can put a selective emitter, an optically selective emitter now, to only emit or, uh, or luminesce through one wavelength, or a very narrow range of wavelength, down onto a solar cell behind this. This idea was first suggested in 2011 by Dan Farrell. So then that solar cell, or the, the wavelengths uh, transmitted here, can be optimized to a particular wavelength of, uh, appropriate to a solar cell, either a a very high efficiency silicon cell, or even a, uh, a something like an alto device's gallium arsenide cell, uh, which can give a very high efficiency, up to something like 80% for um, one or monochromatic radiation. So that part of it can be very efficient. Of course, the front surface of the cell uh, will emit um, uh, th uh, uh, across a wide spectrum range. Um, but that's always true of any solar cell. They always emit across a wide spectrum range. And actually, the losses, depending on the refractive index of the material, for a silicon refractive index of 3.6, it's only about 10% of the light is emitted from the front surface. So it's not too bad a loss. Uh, the back, the selective emitter, uh, the technology for this is well known, actually, in thermoelectrics and in other areas as well. Um, various different photonic uh, band gap structures can be uh, constructed with, with narrow or, or in, indeed even wide windows that can be engineered in there with very good reflection properties outside that window. Uh, with chirped um, photonic um, DVR structures. And also three-dimensional uh, photonic structures are also possible. So uh, that's fairly easy. And the big advantage of, uh, uh, straightforward, uh, I'd say. Uh, the big, big advantage of this is that the um, hot carrier cooling properties here are separated from the transport properties. It doesn't have to have good transport. Uh, and the uh, optical properties are separated out here in the, in the structure behind here. And the electrical properties are taken care of in the very well-optimized solar cell behind. Um, so it's separating them all out. So that's a very good way to uh, certainly investigate the way of uh, designing these devices, and possibly also long-term. 
So that brings me to my conclusions. I've talked initially about hot carrier solar cells and the importance of uh, slowing carrier cooling um, in such devices. I've talked about that carrier cooling me mechanism primarily being the emission of optical phonons, which then decay away into acoustic phonons, and that's the main loss mechanism for most of the energy when they thermalize down to the band edge. I've talked about quantum wells as being um, uh, exhibiting slow carrier cooling and how uh, this could be either due to um, carrier uh, diffusion or indeed to phonon confinement or phonon uh, bottleneck effects occurring in the materials. And indeed that you can get phonon reflection from the interfaces in those quantum wells. I've talked about phononic band gap materials or the large gap between available um, uh, uh, optical and acoustic phonon modes and how many materials exhibit this, many 3.5s, but also many of the transition metals. All the ones I've put up there are nitrides because nitride is a low, sorry, indium phosphide isn't, but most of them are. Uh, there's also uh, many other materials, but you need a light element in, uh, on one side. Hydrides also look interesting as well, actually. Um, and I've shown some, uh, uh, some transient um, um, spectroscopy data to show slowed carrier cooling in imaging phosphide and the hafnium nitride. I've also talked about some potential devices, um, electrically coupled ones, which extract current directly from the device, but require require good carrier transport in this hot carrier material, and also the possibility of um, optically coupled devices which could separate out all those different parts and allow separate optimization. With that, I'll put up a, a picture of our group. Uh, all these are people who've contributed to all this work, um, and um, I'll thank our um, uh, sponsors, the Australian Research Council and the Australian Renewable Energy Centre uh, Agency, um, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>